Good morning. It's another opportunity to maximize 55 minutes of your time. And we're going to use it for current and relevant business conversations that I know will do you good. So let's get on it here in Business Morning on Channels Television. I'm Ini John Mekwa. We start off at the commodities market uh, looking at grains now. Chicago corn features slid more than 1% on Thursday and soybeans fell for the first time in three sessions as forecasts of rains in the United States Midwest eased concerns over dry weather. Wheat lost more, than, more ground, trading near a one-week low as lack of demand for U.S. supplies pressured prices. The most active corn contract on the Chicago Board of Trade fell 1.1% to $5.97 for three quarter of a bushel and soybeans lost 0.4% to $13.55 for three quarter of a bushel. Wheat also gave up 0.3% to $6.15 for a bushel. Expectations of wet weather in parts of the United States Midwest are weighing on corn and soybean prices. Traders in the agricultural market are taking positions ahead of the United United States Department of Agriculture's closely watched agricultural supply and demand estimate report, which is due tomorrow, Friday. Losses in the soybean market were limited by strong Chinese demand. China imported a record 12.02 million metric tons of soybeans in May, and that's more, 24% more than a year ago, according to customs data, as cargoes delayed during recent strict inspections were finally uploaded at the ports. Still staying in the global space now, Malaysian palm oil features traded in a tight range on Thursday as support from a weaker ringgit countered the prospect of rising inventories. The benchmark palm oil contract for August delivery on the Bursa Malaysia Derivatives Exchange edged down 11 ringgit, that's about 3.3%, to 3,309 ringgit, that's $717 uh, during early trade. Malaysia is forecast to experience weak El Nino conditions from June onwards, with the intensity of the weather phenomenon likely increasing to moderate levels by November. That's according to the Environment Minister. The Malaysian Palm Oil Board is scheduled to release its May supply and demand data on June the 12th. The Rigid Palm's currency of trade fell 0.3% against the dollar, making the commodity cheaper for holders of foreign currency. Dillon's most active soy contract fell 0.4%, while its palm oil contract E 0.4%. Soy oil being prices on the Chicago board were up, however, 0.1%. Still we're doing oil now. Crude prices dipped on Thursday as demand concerns tied to a global economic slowdown overshadowed a pending fall in supply with Saudi Arabia's pledge output cuts. Brent features fell 21 cents, that's 0.3% to $76.74 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate Crude features also eased 21 cents, that's also about 0.3%, to $72.72 a barrel. Both benchmarks settled up about 1% on Wednesday, supported by Saudi Arabia's plans for deep output cuts. The prices gains remain capped uh, by rising U.S. field stocks and weak Chinese exports data. A larger than expected build in United States field inventories reported on Wednesday raised concerns over demand from the world's top oil consumer, especially as travel is expected to have grown during the Memorial Day weekend. Gasoline inventories climbed 2.7 million barrels in the week, according to EIA. That's higher than analysts had expected for 880,000 barrels rise. Distillate stockpiles rose by nearly 5.1 million barrels in the week, exceeding predictions. <coughs> Now, in just four months, Nigeria lost estimated 150 billion naira after oil and gas companies operating in the country fled 92.3 million standard cubic feet of gas. <coughs> 
to the gas flare tracker from the National Oil Spill Detection and Response Agency. This represents an increase of 79.5% against 50.3% of the gas flare in the corresponding period of 2022. As a result, the oil firms responsible for the gas flaring are expected to pay $184.6 million. Uh, that's about 85.7 billion naira as penalties for breaching the gas flaring laws in the four-month period. The report also mentions that the volume of gas flared in the four-month period is equivalent to 4.9 million tons of carbon dioxide emission and has a power generation potential of 9,200 gigawatts of electricity per hour. That's a waste there. Nigeria looking for electricity and yet gas flared that could provide electricity is being wasted. Well, uh, the subsidy matter will not go away anytime soon. The Independent Metro Petroleum Marketers Association of Nigeria, Ipman, says it has the numerical strength to force down the price of premium motor spirit, which we know more as petrol. The national president of the association, Mr. Chinedu Okoronkwo, gave this assurance that his fellow members are totally in support of the fuel subsidy removal and express optimism that the price will come down once they start independent importation of the products. Ipman today is making a categorical statement. One, that we are not against subsidy removal. That two, we are not against, because we'll be hearing some people saying that if man is against us to remove her, we are not. By the time this market opens up, they will be begging, the, the price will come down. Look at what is happening in Edu now. Edu, before you were buying it, maybe 900 naira per litre, 800, but today, some station you could get it for 600 and. We just, we just received this uh, regime of uh, not, uh, you know, subsidizing anything before it was solely on an NPC. Now the market, from what we hear, will open up for everybody to participate. And given our number, 80% of the dance film sector, where we control, by the time we start bringing in product, competing with other people too, Competition will also bring the best out of it. The price naturally will go down. We believe that the fundamentals and any other commodity market will also happen in this one. That's right. Uh, looking forward to when actually there'll be more supply, the queues will disappear and the forces of demand and supply will now determine the price of petrol in the country. It's a huge one now. Um, and we do know that uh, the federal government and labor unions are meeting again on June the 19th. Uh, meanwhile, they're supposed to be working out on some palliatives. As we heard from the president yesterday, President Balatimu has given uh, the economic uh, uh, committee uh, led by the vice president the assignment of bringing out some palliative that will be able to buffer some of this impact of the subsidy removal. But meanwhile, let's find out how others are coping with the impact of the subsidy removal. Uh, joining us for that conversation is Mr. Austin Enaje Moisira. He's the chairman and uh, founder of DDM. F Bank, that's used to know him more as Davodani Microfinance Bank, is also the chairman of the board, Nigeria Social Insurance Trust Fund. He joins us virtually. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Mr. Isira. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, let me correct. Uh, I'm, not, I'm the immediate uh, past chairman of uh, Nigeria Social Insurance. All right. Uh, All right, uh, Mr. Isire, thank you for that. So uh, tell us, especially you also a founder of a microfinance bank, and we have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, things going on in the economy now. We talk of inflation. Uh, we have the interest rate, which is supposed to work in your favor as a bank. Um, 
how are you feeling the impact of all of this, especially the removal of subsidy? Okay, thank you. Uh, once again, uh, the government we have today uh, have come up with some clear objective of how to reform their economy. Uh, they have also told us uh, that uh, they will expand the economy yearly by 6% uh, uh, growth and create jobs and unify the exchange rate. So with all of this happening, I can confidently say that the president, uh, President uh, Ahmed Tunubu, has uh, started on a good note. He's already taken on the relevant uh, people discussing with them and uh, appreciate the, 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 the doctrine of teamwork that this thing has to be done together so that uh, we can re rebound the economics and uh, everything will begin to work well. Remember that he also talked about this issue of uh, unifying the exchange rate. I am sure all of this will help to you know, bring uh, life back into the economy in a way that we'll expect. All right, he, he made the, that announcement about unifying the exchange rate, and we've seen a lot of uh, positive reactions to that, but some people wonder how, you know, he would bring that to pass because it doesn't look like just a pronouncement would do that. I mean, even yesterday we saw that the Naira dropped, the value of the Naira dropped to a record low uh, because of... Uh, new demands for the USD. So how do you see that really being implemented? Yes, you know, economic issues are indeed looked at and analyzed. Making a pronouncement on itself will aggravate some of the uh, uh, agitation in the mind of people. That agitation will have an uh, immediate, a very short-term effect. It will create some panic in the minds of people and that will impact on what you are seeing today that the Naira is going down. But remember, he's looking at how do we bring back this economy. One of the issues you mentioned about is the issue of subsidy removal. If that is removed, efficiency, the law of demand and supply will come in. And once all of that are coming into play and some of the infrastructure I look at, the refinery, the private sector will be encouraged to come in. And all of this will have a downward pressure on the, the exchange rates and by extension will be a native exporter of some of our commodities. Once we have all of this, then the price, the Naira exchange rate will begin to experience some gains and that will be better for economy. So the president also promised to reduce interest rates. That sounds, you know, kind of difficult at this time uh, because we see uh, inflation keeps surging. And then with what has happened now, the removal of the subsidy, which of course has uh, led to higher pump price and higher transportation, higher price for uh, cost of food and all of that, we expect inflation to go even higher. We're expecting, especially for that of June. And the CBN on its part tries to tame inflation by increasing interest rates. So it seems there are, uh, you know, two different sides. How do you see the president uh, reducing interest rates uh, while inflation is still surging? Thank you. Uh, you will recall that when an economy is brought to the path of performing, usually all the economic indices will begin to play out positive. And if we begin to see that, then the interest rate regime will go down. But you should understand that this does not happen overnight. These are pronouncements that the president has made. And he is very right. It is hard for businesses to be done at a very high interest rate as well as experiencing today. So 
by the time all of the economic sectors, various sectors of the economy are put on the performing lay, if the interest rate goes down, it will impact on inflation. And uh, today we are talking about 23% uh, thereabout of uh, interest rate, uh, sorry, inflation rate today. But when all the economy activities are on, the production sector are on, the full side of the, the, of, the bank, uh, of the divide is working, and all debt organizations are coming up, uh, you will begin to see a, a brighter light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm positive that with the way the president has started, we're going to witness some tremendous changes. All right, so um, as a microfinance bank, uh, the high interest rates, isn't it good for your business? How has it been affecting your operations as a microfinance bank? Okay, thank you. As uh, MMB, you will recall that uh, the microfinance bank industry was actually created for its own specific objectives. And uh, if you take it back to the regulatory framework designed by Central Bank in 2005 as amended today, they are meant to bring a lot of your bank into the banking uh, sector, uh, WaveNet, and uh, address those who are also at the bottom of the pyramid. So, now, if you look at it from that angle, you discover that the interest rate being high as a single item does not do the whole magic. You are talking of the entire players in that market. The, the, the microfinance bank, the customers who are the consumer of our products, and the economy itself. So a lower interest rate is, will be ideal for those who are borrowing from the microfinance bank. And the higher volume you do, the better for any forward-looking macro finance bank. So it's not all about high interest rate that we, we will say that uh, that is uh, an advantage to MMB. If you maintain a high interest rate and there's no consumer of your product, what happens to you? So all of these things must be put into a one basket, review together, critically analyze them, and then the whole economy will be better for it. So recently, there, there's been a lot of news around microfinance banks. Uh, one uh, newspaper even said uh, microfinance banks are endangered species at this time. Uh, we heard of the revoking of some licenses of microfinance. What really is going on? I know there was a recapitalization, which some banks couldn't meet up. And, uh, of course, uh, those ones who cease to operate. But why so much attention was making the microfinance banks endangered at this time? Oh, thank you for this question. Um, I will tell you that uh, well, individual are entitled to their opinion. Uh, I find it difficult from my perspective to say MMBI they just perceive because the purpose of why MMB came uh, into the banking industry were meant to fulfill a purpose and therefore that purpose has not died. That purpose is still very much alive today. So they are meant to satisfy some segment of the economy. So I, uh, I do not really see how they are endangered perceived. But I also know that the regulatory, the regulatory authority, the Central Bank of Nigeria, have advanced some reasons why some of these microfinance banks have been cancelled. And uh, you have mentioned one of them, the issue of inability to meet up with the new capital regime introduced, which ended April last year. And uh, I also read about the uh, issue that borders of uh, public governance and uh, even some are already of uh, business. So I've read about all of this, and I think the authority and appropriate time will straighten out these clear reasons and then let the public be aware of the real, all of these reasons so that confidence can be built into the market. A trust and integrity is the watchword for 
in, in banking institution. And microfinance bank today, I'll tell you, they are playing a very pivotal role in driving the financial, you know, institution, in driving the economy we have today. And that you cannot take away. All right, thank you so much. We certainly feel, uh, uh, would like to feel more impacts of the microfinance bank. We talk about financial inclusion and um, serving, you know, those at the bottom of the ladder. Thank you so much for your time, uh, founder and chairman of Davodani DDMF Bank. Davodani, we know you must. Davodani Microfinance Bank and former chairman of the Nigeria Social Insurance Trust Fund, Mr. Austin Inajamo Isire. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you very much. All right, now let's take a break. And during that break, we'll also tell you about Dali Dutch's lunch. They will have a lunch of uh, six of their products yesterday. Let's see the colors. Ultralight, more volume, shiny, soft texture with fuller soft texture with fuller tips. Best describe the new product, Darling Dutch's, unveiled here by Darling Nigeria. Models strut the runway as they showcase the uniqueness of this latest addition to Darling Hair Extension brand, which comes in six colors. Ladies and gentlemen, you've seen the Darling Duchess in different lengths and colors. The marketing so manager like, speaks more about the distinctiveness of the new product. The product comes in two unique formats, or uh, two formats. Um, of course, the one on the left is quite popular uh, in the market today, which is the regular cuts, 82-inch length, comes in, in various colors, right? This is the standard uh, uh, format. But then again, you have something we are very, very proud to introduce, right? We have other pre-cut or pre-stretched or pre-picked products in the market today, but none of them will give you what this product offers. And then the product is formally unveiled. It's a first of its launch globally, which is happening in Nigeria. It's made with a, a superior breakthrough Japanese technology outstanding because it gives you ultra weight fiber so that you can sport very long hairstyles it's healthy for your scalp very very healthy for your frontal hair and you're able to express your beauty in all all the possible splendor that you would expect out of it music sensation iris star who is also a brand ambassador of darling hair delivers an energetic performance to the delight of the guests <laughs> Mom had a salon growing up, so I grew up around a lot of like braiding hair and darling. I remember how she used to go and buy like darling for her clients and everything. And now being an ambassador is like just warms my heart so much. I'm so proud of myself and I'm proud of being a darling ambassador. Darling Nigeria prides itself as the biggest hair extension brand that helps every woman find her beautiful. Welcome back to watching Business Morning here on Channels Television. And yes, uh, we're staying with commodities. <laughs> Yesterday was not very good for the Naira, even though um, I'm learning we've hit something worse than that before. But yesterday was not good for the Naira. We saw it dropping. Well, to give us uh, background and foreground on that is Bolani Agbaje, Senior Analyst of Financial Derivatives Company. Thank you for a second time this week, Bolani. Thank you so, for having me. Yeah, so we, we had the Naira fall again yes. yesterday. But what's going on? Why did I guess it's the same, the demand and supply struggles that we're seeing, but it, I think it, it went low from the highs that we had seen last week when the president um, made his first speech and talked about the unification of the Naira. So it kind of brought hopes and signaled hopes within that, um, the exchange rate talks that we had, you know, been battling for the past how many years. So first, we've had the petrol subsidy removal. And I think the next point of call for them is to look for the best way to handle, you know, the exchange rate unification, just to bring in more dollars, increase supply into the system, and obviously take the, the country to 
the next highs that we're expecting to see. And when we talk about increased supplies, uh, I, I don't know. Um, I think I asked our guests yesterday and yeah. they said one of the quick wins would be to increase crude oil production, yeah. which doesn't seem so easy because we've been struggling with oil thefts and mm -hmm. we thought we were winning, but now we've seen our production drop even further. Mm -hmm. So the non-oil export, we have been talking about it like forever, but I mean, really getting the results from that is a bigger deal. Yeah, but you know, with all other industries apart from oil, you'll definitely see money coming in when investors are confident that, you know, they bring in their money and they, are, they have the option of taking it out anytime they want at a rate that makes sense. It's not they bring in their money at a particular rate today and then they're scared that, you know, by the time they're ready to take it out, it, it's a different rate. Or they, would they even be able to, you know, take out this money as much as, you know, they want? The, the airline industry already complains about More than eight, 812 million exactly. dollars. Exactly. So all point. those downside rates risks, uh, you know, what investors would be looking at. So all in all, if, you know, you sort out a situation where investors can confidently bring their money in, it definitely, whatever industry it is, it will definitely, you know, pose a give positive impact on the economy. And we know that while the president is still busy trying to handle the uh, after for, aftermath of subsidy removal, yeah. Yeah. he still has that statement he made on unification of the rates, yes. you know, and people are still looking that, yes, you have said it, how do you want to do it? Well, he did say that, you know, they're going to sit down and discuss on the best ways you know that they would handle this and i'm sure from the from from the backlash that he's seen he's gotten from the subsidy removal i'm sure they will definitely take their time and make sure that if it's favorable for most parties or most stakeholders in the in the country at the moment so i know it's and, and i don't think it's something that would immediately happen Obviously, the subsidy removal happened as soon as he got in, but with the exchange rate, it's probably going to be a gradual comp in comparison to the subsidy removal. Because you can hardly um, sustain a unified rate without supply. Yes. There will always be a black yes. market if the supply yes. does not meet exactly. up with the demand. Exactly. So that's why I meant, you know, with the gradualism that the administration is probably going to focus on because without increasing the supply into the system, there is no way that you're going to, you know, keep, even if you allow the rate float, you need it to float at a very attractive rate. So when you have supply coming into the system, the rates that the exchange rate will finally, the market rates that will be decided on would, you know, be most favorable for all stakeholders, mm. you know, within the system. Just like we're hoping for petrol, that there'll be more supply. No, and definitely. That drive with petrol, down the price it's just a matter of time. We expect that the prices will drop you know, gradually, just as, as we're seeing for other products. But um, obviously, it will take time. You know, most of these marketers would have to find their ground, find where the supply is coming from, because now they have to, you know, figure out their supply by themselves and, um, you know, find how the, the markets would balance going forward. And then the government will still have that responsibility to check for the quality. Yes. So you don't have marketers quality bringing in, become, you know, low quality because exactly. they want to sell it's, it's, at it's, a lower... It's, it's nice that you mentioned that because all other aspects you know, would be at the forefront. You find marketers that would most likely decide to import lower quality of the produce to actually make gains. And um, this is something that... So basically, with this market forces that you're seeing handling the price... It's now very important for regulators. It, it, they become more important at the moment to make sure that all players within the system are playing by the rules and also not, you know, taking advantage of the average Nigerian consumer. Mm. All right. So um, we also have that story where World Bank cuts uh, growth forecasts. Yes. Well, they, they actually increased it from 1.7% to 2.1%, although it's still down from the 3.1% that from we had last seen year. last year. But um, what they mainly cited is that as much as everyone is talking about the fact that Chinese demand is quite slow and all that, but they did highlight the fact that the, rapid, the, the, the way they came out of you know, the COVID lockdowns was quite rapid and it's, it's good news for them. And they do expect that you know, China, Chinese growth would increase by about 4.6%, um, well, 5.6% this year and 4.6% next year. So it, the main driver is from China. And also the fact that you, know, you have high interest rates across the globe, but particularly in China, the rates are quite low and very accommodative. So the high consumption from that country is 
expected to drive, you know, the world growth. And also the fact that inflation rate is also coming down. It's still very high, but coming down in most, you know... Uh, um, yeah, we saw a lot of African countries. Uh, they, I think the, the inflation drop... Um, Ghana, yes. South Africa, I think Egypt yes. also. So you're getting that because, you know, they, they're, they're aggressively chasing the fall in inflation. Although with Nigeria, we're not seeing that because I would think that particularly what's affecting, you know, our prices in this country would be the exchange rate issue. So I guess that's why the interest rates is not necessarily directly bringing down prices the way it should. But in other countries, you have a situation where they're more sensitive to, you know, the high interest rate environment and that's mm. definitely affecting inflation and bringing down the inflation figures. And obviously, before the end of the year, they do expect that inflation numbers generally across across the globe... Including should... Nigeria? Well, <laughs> <laughs> with I think for Nigeria, once we are able to... Sort out supply. Exactly. Supply in all aspects. Supply, so supply in agricultural agriculture, produce. Yes, supply with dollars, supply with all aspects of the economy. And that, and that obviously, you, you categorically keep put it, put it with supply supply side policies. Those are, you know, the policies that we do struggle with within this country. And, you know, I do hope that the, administ the new administration, you know, takes that into account and channels this subsidy, you know, payment into, you know... Boosting into supply. Exactly, exactly. Mm, so security, security is on top of that, that supply element because we know that um, in some parts, especially in the northern parts of the country, yeah. even some of the southwest, farmers can no longer go to their farms. Ex yes. And of course, that is going to disrupt supply of food. Of course. So prices will obviously continue to, to increase. increase because of that. But, um, well, the good news is for certain particular um, agricultural products like cocoa, we're still doing well. And um, we hope this translates to, you know, other commodities that we're comparatively, we have mm. a comparative advantage in. All right. Uh, let's look at, uh, since you mentioned cocoa, uh, other commodities, sugar gained. Almost one yes. percent. Yeah, well, with sugar, we're, we're kind of net importers. Although we do produce sugar, but it's not, you know, enough for our consumption. So we we import a lot of our sugar, and obviously we're on the receiving side of the price. Um, but there is increased supply in Brazil at the moment, so we expect that, you know, going forward the prices decline over time. And obviously we do benefit from the lower prices. Well, with cocoa, there were, you know, suppliers of cocoa were benefiting from the fact that cocoa's, cocoa, the price of cocoa is quite interesting at the moment it's at it's above three thousand dollars that we had not seen in years and um, it's great that we're you know benefiting from this we expect to gain about 706 million dollars i'm sorry 765 million dollars and that's huge for our economy and that's based on you know 250 000, um tons that we do produce and sometimes we depending on the harvest we do produce way more than that up to about 280,000 so it's 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 good for us on on the <laughs> Dollar side of things, but um, and good for the farmers. Good for the farmers. But it would have been better if we're processing it. Well, I, I think value. for Nigeria, we just need to take it step by step. <laughs> <laughs> the initial aspect, get it right and, you know, get the processing of what we're currently doing right and then look for ways to, you know, advance when it comes to, you know, some of these particular products. Mm. So we talked about gas the other day, cooking gas. Yes. Has, has the price, has this well, started the reflecting? Price, well, the price is still ranging at <laughs> about 9000 Per for a 12.5 kg. So we haven't really seen that trickle down. But um, if, if we're seeing increased supply and continuous increased supply in, um, of gas, then we do expect that the prices will drop. Okay, what's going on with our other commodities, our uh, basics? Well, our uh, basics, its prices are still stable. You have some particular commodities that the prices are increasing, so like tomatoes. Then you have like rice, gari. We're still seeing prices stable down, downwards. But with this subsidy removal <laughs> and, and the translation of the higher prices I'm sure to by the time we're having this conversation next, next week. Next week, we, 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 we don't know what will happen. Well, we'll definitely, keep in, we'll definitely keep our eye on some of those commodities and, you know, inform you of the, if of the, if if um, if demand does not increase over time, don't you think that the the sellers will be forced to reduce the price? Um, so especially well, because, because they are perishable. Yes, but because we still have that price stickiness and price rigidity within you know the Nigerian market, so they might not necessarily bring down prices, but just keep prices just the way they are, oh. and that's what we've seen. And considering that this is also planting season, that also has you know that effect on um, prices right now. But as we move into Q3, where we're getting into the harvest season, 
happening, we do expect that, you know, the increased supply would translate into lower prices. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Belanda Agba, Jessica Analyst, Financial Derivatives Company, for, thank you for your time me. this thank you morning. For all right, we are still staying in the market this time. We're going to the equities market with Will Ebong. She comes in now to tell us, uh, well, not very good, marginally bad news. <laughs> I like that <laughs> if there's expression. anything like that, marginally, marginally bad, bad news. news. So yeah. Kind of like manage expectations. It's not that bad, but it's bad. But just yeah, but we still have a 56,000 uh, level. We still have the 56,000 level for how long, Ine? Don't worry. <laughs> we'll keep for it. For how long? We'll you know, the, the, the hawks in the markets are just like, Okay, don't we're don't watching. We're watching. We're coming for you. For you. <laughs> <laughs> so the equities market traded marginally lower in yesterday's trading session. We saw profit taking in Etel Africa. You know, the world, the big guy that took the market up, you know, on Tuesday. So uh, GTCO also contributed to the negative performance. Zenith Bank, as a result, we saw a dip by 0.03% to 56,024 points. Market cap still at the 30 trillion era mark. Now, month to date, and yet today gains still 0.5, 9.3% approximately. We saw total trade yesterday, well, in the green, up 23.3% to 397.63 million units, valued at 6.54 billion era, and all transacted in 5,614 deals, lower than what we had on Tuesday. Now, Sectoral performance, it was just the insurance and oil and gas indexes in the green yesterday. All of the indexes were in the red. Let's look at the top trades yesterday. We saw the MPF Microfinance Bank. You know, investors were just up for that stock yesterday. We're just going to be looking, keeping an eye on what's driving that. Now, GT Co. was also up 43.03 .03 million units traded yesterday. We saw Japal Gold also in that league. But we know that the sell pressure on GT Co. was what put it on the top trades list yesterday. Now, look at the market breadth. Positive market breadth. You know, we saw 32 gainers to 12 losers. So that means there's still hope for the market. Now, looking at the unlisted market, we saw, however, on the flip side was in the green yesterday, 0.19% to close at 726.86 point market cap. Still at the one trillion naira mark. Very, very impressive. Now let's look at the volume yesterday. 1.37 million traded. 35.69 million naira. I mean, that's what we have for the value and all executed in 27 deals. Let's look at the trades that were executed yesterday. We saw Niger Delta Exploration and Production Company had some trades. 8,000 units of its shares to, uh, traded yesterday. But the interesting thing I want to point out here is for VFD Group. VFD Group announced uh, its intention to list on the NGX. So it's going to be delisted from the NASD and listing on the NGX. It had over, interestingly, just had over 4,000 deals. I mean, 4,000 units of its shares traded yesterday at 989 million, about 989 million naira in value. But we're going to be talking to Olua Sheon Dosimu, who is head research, Party and Securities Limited is going to be giving us a deeper dive into what's going on in the market. Good morning, Sean. It's good to have you on the program. Hi, Will. Good morning. Good to be here. Good to have you again. Um, the markets, I'm just going to talk about the equities in general, closed negative yesterday. It's looking like a choppy week. Yes, it is. I mean, from the inaugural speech and how investors reacted to that, especially after the you know removal of four subsidy, we saw that um, the market actually, you know, um, rallied during that week and um since that time we've been seeing that the market has actually been moving in a positive direction um historically we can see that the market is around the 56 um thousand region mm -hmm. the last time we saw the market at this point was in 2008 but generally if you look at the market you'd see that um, nigerian stocks generally are undervalued mm -hmm. i mean that's if you're comparing them to their book value and um which we're seeing now is that what we're seeing now is that um, since 2021, the market has been creating new highs. One of the questions that has been on the minds of a lot of investors and market play players is that is the market going to break, break out from this 56,000 points or going to fall out from this point? So right now, what investors are actually doing, uh, one looking at, um, or we're actually expecting the um, half year results to come in or the Q2 results to actually hit the market, we'll start to see a lot of that from July. And um, also, the, the, another thing that people are looking at, investors are looking at, has to do with the policy direction from the new administration. I mean, if this government actually do something, if they do something quickly about the exchange rate regime, 
I believe that that would also open our market up to um, foreign participation, which we have not seen since, you know, 2019. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and once that happens, we, we would tend to see more participation in our market and obviously more inflows will come into our market. So interesting times for us. Mm -hmm. Historically, we've seen that the month of June has only closed in the positive just once in the last five years. So generally, we know that um, the month of June is always a profit-taking month. We, we don't see a lot of volatility in the market. I mean, people start to prepare, you know, for the summer holidays and we'll see investors come back into the market around August. And we start to see a lot of activities, you know, from the third quarter till the end of the year. So right now, that's where the focus is on. Mm. So we're going to be looking out for June. You did say it's a month of profit taking, but it's looking like mixed performance right now. Investors are coming in, taking profit and market is still going up. So we are going to be keeping an eye out as to if June would stay true to his historical <laughs> as a moment. But looking at VFD, there's this interesting news. Uh, they've been listed on the NASD as the unlisted market for since 2020, that was when they were listed. Yes. Now they are, you know, saying they want to delist and list on the Nigerian exchange. Uh, well, just to access, you know, bigger equity markets, uh, capital, increase their visibility and strengthen their financial position. What do you think, how do you think investors are going to welcome this or perceive this news? I mean, look, looking at what has happened in, in, in the time past, um, when companies list on the exchange, historically, um, investors are always excited. You always see that initial euphoria in the market where and people start to take position in those in, in the stocks. So it's it's good news. I mean, we would like to see more companies list on the exchange. But then the question is that what do we know about um, VFD and, and their plans? I mean, right now we don't know too much. We know that um, the company has a diverse portfolio of investments in various sectors. I mean, such as the banking, technology, media, um, energy and real estate. We also know that um, for their last results, I mean, when it comes to their gross, um, for their gross earnings for 2022, um, for their gross earnings and profit before tax, um, their numbers were quite impressive. I mean, their gross earnings increased by about 87%, um, profit before tax increased by over 100%. And, and historically, they, they, they've been paying dividends at least for the last five years. So um, we're actually seeing good numbers, but uh, we would also like to, you know, have more information about the listing. And let's not forget, it's still subject to regulatory, um, it's still subject to regulatory. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> uh, Shane, uh, talking of wait, while we're waiting for this like, regulatory approval, will VEFD's share price is over 244 Naira. So... Uh, Let's just give us a breakdown here, paint a picture. Are they going to the list and list on the NGX at that price, or are we going to see a share restructuring? What's going to happen? Do you think investors are going to buy at the price that they're currently trading on on the NESD? Um, so right now, uh, I, I don't have a lot of information about that, um, and I'm not too sure about whether or not they're going to do the share restructuring, but um, uh, I believe that when, when, you know, the process is, um, when the process starts to crystallize, We'll get more information about that. Right now, I don't think I can make a lot of comments about that <laughs> because I know that, yes, I mean, at that price of 214, I don't, I don't see them listing on the exchange or the NGX at that same price. Hmm. So I believe that once we have more information about, you know, what they plan to do, we would um, have a um, clear direction on what, you know, the price will look like on the, on the Nigerian exchange. Hmm. Definitely. This is a developing story and we'll keep track of it. We'll definitely let yeah. investors know what to expect and the outcome of all this. So uh, thank you so much, Sean Dosumu, uh, Head Research Patent Securities Limited, for your insights on the program. Thank you. So the bond market was pretty quiet yesterday as well in the fixed income space. Treasury bills also uh, quiet, seeing some bullish sentiment coming in because of, you know, the NTB auction that, you know, investors are reacting to that. And stop rates increased there, but we're just going to um, let Ladi come do his thing because, yeah. you know, the market... No, we'll go to London and yeah, then Ladi will Yes, and the rest of it. So in it, it's just cautious trading for June. If you want to take profit now, this is the time, Ini. Don't say I didn't tell you. <laughs> I thought it was selling me and go away. I no, didn't know right it was now, it's in June. In June. Okay, <laughs> all right. Well, let's head to London now where Juliana is standing by. Juliana, uh, good morning. Good to have you. Your prime minister has been in Washington for days now. I think today is his final day. What are some of the highlights of his meetings and conversations over there? 
Good morning, Innie. Well, today is D-Day because today is the day where Prime Minister Rishi Sunak will meet uh, Joe Biden, the US president, at the White House. Uh, this is the first official uh, visit he has had to the White House since becoming a conservative leader in October. And it's a pretty high stakes meeting for obvious reasons. We know that Britain's closest ally is America. And even for Joe Biden, who just a couple of months ago didn't even know how to pronounce Rishi Sunak's name, it's also important for him because I think he will want to show the American people that Europe, um, you know, is very, very, very allied to closely tied to America. And that's obviously very important because there is the ongoing war in Ukraine. Uh, they are expected to talk about a series of things, one of them, of course, being Russia. China is certainly going to be on top of the cards as well. As, of course, the Green Initiative, which cost uh, Joe Biden um, nearly half a trillion US dollars. And that is uh, the plan for the Conservative government to make Britain a leader when it comes to clean and green energy. It is a high stakes meeting. It is good for both of them to be seen together on the global stage. Of course, they've met four times in the past, once in San Diego. They've also met in Japan at the G7 summit, the G20 summit, and then the summit, um, the Northern Ireland um, Peace Treaty which they were commemorating uh, the 25 years of. So it is an important gathering and a meeting between the two of them. And I've got to say, Joe Biden does appear to have rolled out uh, the red carpet because um, Rishi Sunak has been staying um, at the official White House guest house, which is called Blair House. The last time um, one of his uh, predecessors uh, stayed there was back in 2016 of David Cameron, uh, Boris Johnson, Theresa May, they didn't get uh, that treatment. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens when they meet later today. I think there is a joint televised address which they will be giving probably about three o'clock local time here when America wakes up. Um, so, yes, um, very important and really good uh, for Rishi Sunak. Yeah, good for him. And uh, I learned one of the things that they may discuss is that summit, the very first uh, AI safety summit which the UK will be hosting. And that could also form a part of their conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we just received uh, that press release this morning. It was just announced today that later this year, I believe in early autumn, uh, the UK will be hosting the first ever AI safety summit. Um, anybody who's been watching telly or reading the news in the past couple of uh, days will know that there is a huge fear um, about artificial intelligence and where it's going. Is it already out of control? We know that it's helped with so many things, um, including uh, finding uh, results for incurable diseases. Um, but certainly, I think now a lot of experts who work within the sector are saying, look, we really need to keep a heart, um, an eye on this before it gets out of control. I think last week there were reports that within the next 20 years, uh, some AI technology uh, would be powerful enough to wipe out um, nearly one billion people on this planet. So it's pretty serious. Um, Rishi Sunak has already hosted um, AI lab CEOs uh, throughout this year to ensure that they are doing their best to make sure that the technology um, is safe. Uh, but clearly, this now needs to be taken to a global stage. That certainly is going to make up part of the discussion between Sunak and Biden uh, later today. Like I said, we just received the press release um, this morning. So let's see uh, just how huge uh, that uh, AI safety summit is going to be in the UK in the autumn. Yeah, I'm sure it's going to bring a lot of activity to the UK, especially to London. Uh, by that time, Juliana, and get your hands very busy and full at that time. But thank you so much. We'll talk more during uh, Business Incorporated. Thank you. So in comes cryptocurrency. I hope AI can trade. <laughs> Am I AI? Crypto. Am I are you AI? Are you are you Laddie Williams? Oh, you are <laughs> AI Laddie Williams. I guess I'm just human intelligence. Oh, oh, yeah. okay. All right, we'll or do a maybe test. Just human we'll test. We have to test that, Laddie. We can't no. take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's see what's happening uh, with the market now. We see it's uh, fifty neutral. Still, still standing on neutral. We did touch fear um, recently. Let's look at the top cryptocurrencies we track. Now we see Bitcoin. Yeah, losing. Uh, looks like it's losing that twenty-six thousand um, level again. Two point one two percent down. We still have that regulatory onslaught there uh, with the U.S. Um, Securities and Exchange Commission on the crypto industry, and that's impacting uh, investors right now. Seeing sell-offs now. Ethereum still managing to hold that one thousand eight hundred level. It's also down 2.39%. Big, big move down again. 
Uh, BNB, that's a native token for the Binance Exchange. Still a lot of sell pressure. The investors are still wary, you know, about holding this one because um, the U.S. SEC is still attacking and uh, still uh, issues with the Binance U.S. arm um, right now. So that's um, impacting investors right now. They don't know what to do uh, with the token. We see. Uh, we don't know if the, the U.S. SEC is going to win against Binance at this point. Cardano, that's also down 6.38%. U.S. SEC also after this one saying it's a security um, at this point. So we're seeing um, traders quite wary about that. To so an XRP, even though we thought that the XRP was winning the case um, against the U.S. Security and, and Exchange Commission, we're seeing um, sell pressure there too. 2.24% down, um, trying to lose that 50 cent um, level. Let's look at the top um, gainers um, this morning. We see XDC is top of the counter, just single digits um, gains. And we see stable coins on that list showing that traders are quite fearful um, right now. Let's bring in Rume Ofi now, financial market analyst. Hello, Rume. Good morning. Good morning, laddie. Good morning. Yeah, yeah, Rume. So it's uh, it's an onslaught right now uh, on the crypto industry, and the SEC has quite a long list of allegations against um, Binance US. That's the US arm. Um, uh, we're also seeing the former uh, CEO of that Binance US arm. Um, she's also testifying you know, against Binance right now. Do you think Binance can survive these, this um, regulatory onslaught in the U.S.? Uh, I, I think uh, a lot is happening. A lot will still happen. But again, let's open our minds to what is going on. What is going on needs some level of clarity. There's something that the SEC is using as a way to determine whether certain investment contracts actually fall in to be securities or commodities. That is actually known as the ROE test. The ROE test actually was created uh, by the Supreme Court to determine whether certain transactions qualify to be investment contract. And, and the act is Security and Exchange Act of 1934. That is what the SEC is using to base what they classify. And a couple of all of these fall into it. So the following, ele the following elements that, follow that makes this uh, these um, tokens, either securities or commodities, are an investment of money. We have seen uh, stable coins where they invest, and at a particular period of time, you're getting some money uh, in common enterprise, which is which it's either an exchange platform or maybe a wallet provider where you could do certain transactions and gain yield as, as the end of the day you know, with the expected profit. Because for you to stake either different tokens or stable coin, you need to get certain profit. So all of these are the things that fall in the hour. Uh, I think the last one is to derive uh, to be derived from an effort of others. So the exchange platforms are the one either going into different activities for yield uh, or mining processes for them to do. So all of these things fall into uh, uh, why the SEC are saying these are securities. A quite a lot of them. A quite a lot of them. And at the end of the day, uh, they, although there've been talks with uh, the SEC and uh, Shang Peng Zhao of, uh, of, uh, of Binance, which is also known as Season, there have been discussions. So, peradventure, we were looking at maybe a slam or something, but it is getting really, really messier because... Uh, and, uh, Rume, we, we're not, uh, and Rume, we, we know this market, you know, definitely it's seen as the wild, wild west. You know, at this time, a lot of crypto scams, rug pulls. Do you think with this um, regulatory onslaught we're seeing, all of that is going to, you know, simmer down in the market, talking about the rug pulls. Exactly. Although some persons have this um, notion that crypto is not supposed to be regulated, which have actually given opportunity to, to bad actors to act. But I, I, I think this is going to wipe out, uh, one, tokens that, that, are, that are useless, perceiving to be having some kind of good uh, uh, use cases that will be wiped out, then uh, what, what the SEC is going to create some very huge sanctions. Paradventure, I, I mean, I'm looking at it from this way. Uh, Binance US might not survive it because all of the S, all of the tokens listed, Paradventure, if there's going to be some kind of, um, you get to do some kind of soft landing, they are going to delist all of those uh, 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 tokens and, and it's going to go to weigh heavily. And we're talking about uh, an outflow of $2.2 billion already from, uh, from, from, from Binance. And uh, just, just, just now we are seeing, uh, hearing stories that uh, the, the, uh, the SEC uh, chair, Gary Gessler, actually applied to work, to be an advisor for yeah, Binance. Yeah, I saw that headline this morning. <laughs> Quite interesting. <laughs> but at the end of the so, day, so, I hope he doesn't have some kind of vendetta, but not, not saying he should, because he, it was just an application, really. 
Yes. Uh, so all of this is making the whole thing messy. But I like what uh, Stella Lumen said, uh, the uh, senator, that um, the, the Congress, Congress had to come up with something that is going to guide, guide yeah, all, all of these things. And right. also, uh, uh, yeah, Coinbase is also involved and Coinbase is also being sued. So all of these uh, are going to, it's going to be tough for the space. So like I said, we have to be careful. Investors right. need to be careful. Yeah. And, and one other thing that is very, very important in all of this the, the, the court, uh, in the U.S. District Court, is is seeking for an injunction to freeze Binance assets. Is is seeking an injunction to freeze Binance Binance assets. And if it is true that Binance is commingling his commingling his funds, Binance U.S. and Binance International, that means there's a big trouble. Right. Coming. Right. All right. We'll keep we'll keep tracking that. Still a developing story uh, right now. But I guess I, I guess we can call it the great cleansing of the crypto industry. Thank you so I, much. I, 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 call it, I, I call it the Amagedon of the Amagedon. I call it the Amagedon. All right. <laughs> All right, we'll stick with that. Thank you so much, uh, Rume Ophi. Thank you, Ladi. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Eni, that's the debate right now. Are you a security or a commodity in the crypto space? Well, it's a great cleansing. After the cleansing, then yeah. we'll find out where Binance will be. Exactly. And investors, I think, before then, would have taken, yeah. taken position. Quite, quite an in incredible exchange. It, it is. Since and, I, and I hear rumors so excited about the cleansing, but yeah. I, I think some investors are not very happy oh, at this time. Oh, it's going to be time. painful, definitely. Yeah, it's a painful cleansing, exactly. it is. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. At 1.30. All right, so that's it on the program. Thank you so much for being a part of Business Morning. 55 minutes is gone already. How time flies when you're having fun. Good thing is we'll do it again tomorrow. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Go out there, make some money, have fun. Mm -hmm.